So manufacturing is the source of the made world. The carpet, the wallpaper, the furniture, the lights, the electronics, and the coffee urns that are supporting our forum in this room, for example. Manufacturing is all around us, and it's the grand challenge focus of the Federal Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. Purdue University's Manufacturing Hub has been an early participant in that initiative with a focus on reducing the barriers to using high-performance computing for and simulation faced by small to medium-sized manufacturers. How are we doing that and what are the opportunities? Let's take a look. So, ManufacturingHub.org was spun out of a very successful and ongoing effort here at Purdue University known as, as, known as NanoHub by the urging of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. NanoHub now for 10 years has been publishing research simulation software and making it usable via your web browser. This has been a key innovation in acquiring a user community over the last 12 months of over 250,000 users from all across nanotechnology, research, and education. And here's just a little map showing where users are across the planet for NanoHub. So Manufacturing Hub is created for a new program, the National Digital Engineering and Manufacturing Consortium, which is a public, private, and academic partnership, as I said, intended to reduce barriers for these small and medium-sized manufacturers when they try to innovate by using computing and simulation. It was initiated by a memorandum of understanding signed at the White House on March 2nd of 2011 with an interesting list of partners from the National Economic Council, Office of Science and Technology Policy, Economic Development Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce, National Institute for Standards and Technology, Department of Energy, NASA, and NSF. And then with our partners from the private sector, Procter & Gamble, Lockheed Martin, John Deere, General Electric, federal agencies and private partners matching the funding here, and the Ohio Board of Regents and us, Purdue University, with funding from the state of Ohio and the state of Indiana. So it's a, an interesting new concept here in putting all of these partners together to basically pilot the advanced manufacturing partnership effort, which now has a very active program, the National Network for Manufa Manufacturing Innovation, which we'll talk about in more detail. So Manufacturing Hub on the web, resources for small manufacturers to help them in their use of high performance computing, really focused on delivering apps, much like your smartphone, your tablet, computer, to make the use of the computer disappear and let you focus on getting your work done. So how do we do that? This is an example for using a sophisticated fluid flow simulation program known as Open Foam will calculate how gases or liquids will flow in a variety of manufacturing situations. We'll take a first look at how fluids might flow in a piping manifold. So we're trying to analyze, say, how a coating will flow out onto a uh, production line so that we can coat a, uh, a web of material going by. If you were to use open foam in the traditional way, Procter & Gamble provided this as an example of how they would use it, and you get to become a bit of a computer expert. As an engineer, you would know about STL files, which describe the geometry of your piping manifold, and you would learn to put them in a certain place on your computer, otherwise you won't even get started. Step number two, you'll learn something about geometry from a mathematical and computing perspective and learn about a bounding box and how to find the vertices for that and provide that as input. Now, of course, there is software to do that, and you could learn to use that software, but now you begin to build a workflow of tasks that extend well beyond just actually saying, open foam, you know, run, please do something for me. No, there's a whole lot of work, 26 steps here, including the visualization, which is an entirely different program, where you decide, well, how many flow lines do I want, and how long should they be, and how many particles will define them as I watch the flow through my piping manifold. You can see that you could spend a lot of time working your way through those 26 steps, just learning everything you need to know. Yet, for this particular application of open foam, you really only need a very small amount of input. You don't need all the flexibility, all the generality that's represented here. 
So we're going to build an app, and we have built an app on Manufacturing Hub so that you can do this simply. It's a web browser interface. You have a few parameters to type in, in fact, just a total of nine, and that includes three STL files that you still at the moment have to know about to describe the geometry of your pipe, the walls, the surface through which the liquid enters that pipe, and the surfaces, perhaps, the exit nozzles through which that material will exit the piping manifold. And then you can click your browser window to say simulate, and you get a picture like this, predefined, and it's going to be probably exactly enough to tell you, am I getting an even flow of this material I want to coat as a big sheet goes by? And you can see from the picture, the flow looks pretty even. The geometry can be tweaked to uh, manage that, and you can simulate and focus on the engineering of exactly what nozzle do I need here, shape of this slit, to get an even flow. And how fast will the flow be? Those are the couple of things that this app will tell you. How even is your flow? How fast is your flow? That's pretty much what you need to know to design this. You don't need the 26 steps. Well, we need to connect this with the community, so we're working with a company in the Purdue Research Park known as Imaginistics, and they have built what they call the Visual Seek community, which looks at requests for quotes, RFQs, from the U.S. government and expanding into the private sector, where a customer says, probably an OEM, or the Department of Defense is a big user of this, we need a certain part. Here's a blueprint, a description of its shape. And unlike keyword searches on Google, Imaginistics can search for shapes based on shape description and find corresponding parts that may already exist in a catalog, but help connect the buyer with the seller. What we're going to do is connect Manufacturing Hub and the ability to model as well, so you now have a community that has customers, has engineers who can satisfy those constraints, but if the part's not off the shelf, maybe I need to model and make sure that the part will perform according to the specifications that the customers set. So we're trying to build that into a community that grows and, and is part of the support for this Federal Advanced Manufacturing Partnership Initiative that was announced in June of 2011. It has two major components. It has a network, a national network of manufacturing innovation institutes and manufacturing demonstration facilities, and a materials genome initiative, which is not biological per se, but is focused on design of materials from the ground up. Because what you can make is limited by the materials that you have. New advanced materials allow you to make things that couldn't be made with performance that could not be achieved before. So a pilot center for this national network was launched in August. It's the National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute, NAMII, or NAMI. It's located in Youngstown, Ohio, and it's focused on building parts not by taking a chunk of metal and cutting away everything you don't want to be in the part, but by taking metallic powders and sintering them together and creating the part that you do want. There are some tremendous advantages that are possible with this approach, but it needs a lot of work, and so this center is, is pioneering it. It has $35 million, roughly, in federal funding and a one-to-one -one plus type match from the private sector, so it's a, a very large effort, and uh, it's also working with the first of the manufacturing demonstration facilities, which is focused more on composites, which is a facility that was been, has been built up over time at Oak Ridge National Labs. So these are two examples of the kinds of technology-focused centers that the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership seeks to create to jumpstart <coughs> work towards an advanced manufacturing future, not just stamping things out the same old way, but bringing new technologies to bear on challenging problems and to uh, support society. I mentioned the Materials Genome Initiative. This is a white paper that announced that as well, and Purdue was nicely mentioned in that, the work on NanoHub being seen by this initiative as an example of how the community might be brought together to focus on this topic area and collaborate the way the nanotechnology community has been collaborating. So these computational tools certainly are part of designing materials from first principles and creating the material that has the properties you might want. So the goal with the additive uh, excuse me, the advanced manufacturing partnership is to create up to 15 linked regional institutes, each with its unique technical focus. 
So there's going to be a common approach, and the NAMI in Youngstown is piloting this to reach the uh, economy with the benefits of the results from these centers. So there needs to be a common approach to the infrastructure of these centers so they can collaborate easily. The intellectual property so that we can commercialize well from all of these centers. And how they perform the contract research that comprise the sub-projects within their technical focus area and the performance metrics for how we evaluate how these centers are doing and provide the appropriate governance and oversight to make them the most effective by keeping them on track. The manufacturing demonstration facilities, or MDFs, are there to support access to advanced facilities, so the equipment that lets you carry out an advanced manufacturing process or actually pilot the production of a new product idea based on the technology. The whole approach has some roots and some similarities to what's done in Germany with the Fraunhofer Institutes where there is this tight collaboration across a spectrum of academic and commercial entities. So it's really all about the missing middle, because what's very interesting is when you look at manufacturers, the vast majority of them have under 500 employees. These are small firms. It's well over 80 percent are in that zone. And they are a challenge to reach and bring these technical innovations. So the whole idea for the centers is to be a bi-directional link between national labs and university research activities and investments and these smaller firms. And the focus is on an area of technology that the Department of Defense would term technology readiness level, or TRLs, four through seven. What does that mean? TRLs have a focus range from one to nine. One is absolute bleeding edge research. The latest particle physics effort might be, would be an example of that. What's underlying our universe at the particle physics, quantum physics level? Technology readiness level nine, I want to buy a gallon of milk, I go to the grocery store, it's on the shelf, it's in a standardized container, I go, it bar scans, and I'm out of there. You know, quick swipe with my de debit card. Everything is completely smooth, it's absolutely, literally, off the shelf technology. University research generally is viewed as running one, totally bleeding edge, to three, we kind of really figured it out in the lab and we're ready to move on and a faculty member will typically move on to the next interesting question. And there it sits, well published, the phenomena well understood, but there's a big gap, levels four, five, six, seven, before you get to the early adopter commercialization, which would be level seven, first time you see it on the market. So that's the idea here, is to make that kind of connection across the gap. Bell Labs was classically successful at doing this, and so we could look there to get some inspiration for what are the components we need. Well, this all needs to be interdisciplinary. Bridging that gap isn't done by just electrical engineering if it's a new electronic device. You've got to get it into a product. There's going to be a lot of other aspects necessary. You need expertise, of course, and you need a critical mass. You need technically savvy management who understands that they're trying to get difficult things done by crossing all the way from four to seven. It's not just an incremental change. The management of a non-incremental change is tricky. And it's a mix of near, medium, and long-term projects. And then the idea here is to show that you can make it and then scale it to quantity. Because it's not great to say that, okay, one person has a hover car, but we can't make them at a price where anybody else can afford them, so nobody gets the hover car of the future, right? Okay, so where do you position these centers in a chart here of funding and activity for existing work? So this is an interesting graph that really shows a gap that's being filled by this network as part of the Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. So the annual budget vertical axis on the left, projects from 100,000, million, 10 million, 100 million per year spending, so it's logarithmic scale. And then across the bottom is this manufacturing maturity Technology readiness level one on the left, basic research, nine on the right. If you look at existing federal activities, the blue boxes, you see that there are activities that are funded at different funding levels, different vertical levels, and in different zones, but they tend to be focused over here in one to three, a little bit into four and beyond with these particular NSF industry university joint centers. And then there's a good, you know, good funding over here in helping 
businesses become more effective at deploying technologies, more efficient at deploying technologies, known as the Manufacturing Extension Partnership from NIST. And then there are state or regional centers that sort of span a lot of levels here, but they tend to be funded at a lower level. Indiana has a 21st century fund that a while back was very heavily focused up here, and Purdue is very successful at working with them. Other centers may focus more on, you know, the economic development of more immediate plays. Manufacturing innovation institutes are the red box. They go in a gap here, a middle zone spanning the four to seven, but also a funding level that's quite a bit more significant than what you might see from some of the state funding. So I really emphasize that. It is really attacking something that hasn't really been attacked before. And how do you do that? One of the key things that they want to focus on is demonstrations with these small to medium enterprises. They really want to see it in the hands of those who will scale it out and create the things that form our world. So the way to do this is they're looking always for co-investment, dollars plus existing resources contributed by academia, industry, professional societies, foundation, and government at all levels, not just the federal level. So these are interesting organizations to try to coalesce and then to manage. So we have some interesting challenges in the policy here of thinking about how do we do well with achieving these kinds of uh, success with these kinds of collaborations. We're trying to collaborate on both the innovation and the commercialization. It's essential that you be able to demonstrate an ability to go to scale. And of course, if you're going to go to scale, you need people to help make those things when it comes time to make them in scale. When we think about smartphones and some of the successful smartphones, the thing that impresses me a lot from a manufacturing perspective is that there can be an announcement of a new smartphone. It can go on the market a few, three, four weeks later. And up to that point, there's only been prototypes really made. And then the tap gets turned on to order, and in three or four months with some of the very popular ones, you can have 30 to 40 million of these devices in the hands of people after only three or four months from a standing start. That is incredible acceleration, and it takes an incredible workforce and a skilled workforce to do that. And then these centers should showcase and deploy these new capabilities and processes and products because that's about how you get it out because there's a lot of these small and medium-sized firms. In the United States alone, there are 300,000 manufacturing firms. How do you reach them? You've got to have something that will catch attention and get into the media to get the word out. And of course, this is a federal initiative, so it's all about advancing domestic manufacturing. So how can we use this to build the U.S. economy and our global competitiveness? The funding for these centers looks a little bit like this, it's kind of complicated perhaps, but starting in the upper left, federal funding, 70 to 120 million is what they're proposing. Of the federal funds, there's a one-to-one -one or better match. And this is over five to seven years. So we're looking at really some substantial sized programs where you have funding for equipment, administrative costs, project grants to carry out work, and then competitive project grants as things go along and you begin to see where do we want to drive this as we get more experience. And those are plotted here with colors. And if you look a bit more closely, uh, what you see is a definite sense that the federal funding sort of tails off and you're trying hard. You've got to get these competitive project grants and engage the community around this particular technology of this center and get the community funding in there and make it active. So we're obviously very interested in this here at Purdue. We've been working since the very beginning with this with Manufacturing Hub and our technical assistance program led by Purdue to help us find the small Indiana manufacturers that have shown us how we can help them with high performance computing and simulation. We have some nice examples. But what are our strengths? Well, certainly Purdue research results, we have leadership in relevant areas to manufacturing that we've taken to the level three or even four stages. So there's opportunities to make connections there. We have strong colleges both of engineering and technology. So we have a range of skills and a range of interests in our faculty and our students that nicely connect to the needs of this manufacturing initiative. We also have our Cranert School of Management with its strong focus on management of industry. So we have sort of all the pieces when you put together a policy concept about what do you really need. Plus, we've built four statewide incubators. So certainly in this part of the Midwest, 
well positioned. When you look at getting in academia and you think about workforce development, a lot of the workforce development is viewed by the federal agencies as appropriate to be carried out by community colleges. And Indiana is the only state where it's one-stop shopping. We have a single administrative node that gets all community college in the state. If you look at the Youngstown Institute for Additive Manufacturing, they have seven different community college partners, and it covers a total of seven counties. Because the way it's done in Ohio and Pennsylvania, it's one per county. Seven different negotiations. So we have an advantage on that. Indiana is the most manufacturing oriented of the economies of all the states, so it's a natural play here. And we're in a region that is heavily manufacturing oriented. All of our surrounding state are great partners here. And we build up a great cyber infrastructure with a hub platform that supports NanoHub and it has been recognized, as I mentioned. And then there's a whole range of good academic partners here in the land-grant institutions that are focused on engagement with society, would be natural partners here. And then a few others. So I mentioned TAP, the Technical Assistance Program, which serves about 400 companies uh, every year with consulting funded by the state of Indiana, by Purdue faculty and graduate students. That, over 28 years, has built up an incredible base of experience with how to carry out short projects that really benefit industry, dollars and cents, and also an incredible Rolodex, if you will, of Everyone in the state knows Purdue, and we know them. And our manufacturing extension partnership is similar. We're building here at Purdue an effort called INMAC, focused on bringing a lot of these pieces all together and uh, receiving more state funding that will link all of the academic players here at Purdue with the broader community across the state. And then our participation in Endemic, which as I said is sort of the uh, first pilot of the pilot for the uh, Advanced Manufacturing Partnership. And we've become known for working with companies here in Indiana. A few examples, Jekyll Plastic Products down near Indianapolis, Boss Industries and Decker Vacuum Technologies uh, up near the lake, and our work in helping Jekyll simulate the structural strength of this pallet with the internal structure of this molded plastic pallet shown to help them try to capture the worldwide business for a, a very large automobile manufacturer seeking to replace steel pallets in all their production facilities with plastic which have many performance characteristics that they s deeply desire, but it's a challenge to get this material to perform at the levels needed. With a simulation, we helped Jekko take a step to remedy a small cosmetic issue, if you will, but important to the customer on the underside of the pallet without compromising the strength, beyond the simulation capabilities that they were using on their desktop computers in the company. So in summary, it's a, a real sea change here in opportunity for universities. It's one that's about engagement. It's one about working in TRL levels four through seven and really helping bridge that gap, not just in TRL levels one, two, and three. We're going to be gaining insight by watching the play out at NAMI, which is the pilot for these network, the network of up to 15 centers that we talked about. And to be in, engaged, we need to be working on building our partnerships both inside and outside of Indiana, lining up that match so that we can play in these very large centers and focus on how we will deliver real results to the bottom line of employment and financial competitiveness of these small and medium manufacturers that dot our landscape, particularly here in the Midwest. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Much. Uh, first of all, I applaud your uh, systems approach to this. Uh, I think you've touched on, I, I would say, all the key elements of uh, things that I have seen uh, looking at from an, both a, uh, a Department of Defense perspective, but also from an industry perspective. A couple things that came to mind was uh, the uh, one was the aspect of uh, how you kind of navigate, we call this. Uh, valley of death between the, the TRL levels and the capability and actually putting into practice. And you touched a little bit on the importance of uh, what we would say test beds, be able to insert ideas and kind of kick the tires because I think all of us who've been around a while have seen what we thought was a really good idea. And um, when we put it into kind of a field activity, realized that what we were doing at the university or laboratory or R&D center, engineering center, 
wasn't quite uh, what we were expecting, so that continuum of a feedback loop between the application and the user of the application and these centers is important. Second point was I really like the incubator type of environments because that does create a forum. Uh, and part of the problem really resides out to the, um, I'll say the customer, whether it's government, industry, uh, is being able to articulate well, what's the problem you're having? And then having a forum of really smart people there <laughs> that says, well, you know, I think I've got a solution right here that uh, was looking like it could be applied directly because you're at the leading edge here at Purdue in discoveries of materials, properties, uh, engineering, manufacturing, uh, and you're, you're kind of uh, in, in have a center. The other aspect, which I'll put my industry hat on, I had for a period of time, was uh, a forum of conductivity is the summer intern programs that the industries have where they bring in really good, uh, and I've used that uh, both in government hats and industry hats where we would bring uh, in the summer interns, we would place uh, uh, your, uh, the young students at the graduate or undergraduate level, particularly in the junior, senior le level or graduate, for a period of time to work directly, uh, whether it was in the industry or the Naval Research Laboratory or whatever, where they got to see uh, some of the er really leading edge work as kind of a partnership, but then they would take that information back into their own organizations, in this case Purdue, and you get that kind of a, a continuum of, of uh, dialogue that occurs to say, okay, there's other problems that occur. So the summer intern program was a really good mechanism that really uh, spans <coughs> all aspects of what you were talking about. So just a few comments, but I really, again, applaud the overall direction you're taking and, uh, and really a, a very complete systems approach to it. So I didn't see any holes or anything that I would say this is obviously, but just a couple other things that might be, uh, you might want to really emphasize more in terms of uh, continuing success. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. You know, on innovation, I think it's expensive, it's challenging for the small to medium-sized company to afford that. I think that's one of the real beauties of this advanced manufacturing partnership is making it easier by placing some shared resources in the manufacturing demonstration facilities and in the form of these innovation centers to partner with the small to medium-sized company to help them do that innovation. I think those centers also, to your second point, as I would summarize it, help the community, the sharing of ideas. Oh, I have a, a, a technique that might be applicable over here to your problem and, and help facilitate that communication. And I certainly agree with you that cross-fertilization by sharing personnel, such as students and summer internships, is a strong way for making these kinds of intellectual connections that are so critical and founding the understanding that's really critical for workforce development for our students coming out. We see a little bit of that here at Purdue, again, with these technical assistance program projects that uh, support up to 40 hours of consulting when we involve a graduate student who sees firsthand, this is a particular small company's problem, I helped solve it, now I understand something relevant to my research, but it's actual real world applicable. Thanks. Real advantages of additive manufacturing is the opportunity to differentiate the product, but standardize the process, yes. the manufacturing process, so that uh, small manufacturers don't have to integrate with different supply chains as far as CAD CAM materials, finishing operations, tooling, mm -hmm. which is a big cost. Yes. Um, this seems to be um, an area where there could be a tremendous impact and also leverage if there could be more standardization in the manufacturing process so that the smaller and medium-sized manufacturers would uh, have the opportunity to be part of several supply chains instead of one or two major supply chains who are willing to co-invest yes. in the, uh, the tooling costs and some of the other costs. Uh, how, how do you see this in, uh, in the model you're talking about? So I, I think this model is working on two issues. So the additive manufacturing in particular in metals is still a f actually has a many important 
unknowns in the TRL 1, 2, and 3 area. It is not the case that we have the laboratory ideas proved and it's more about how do we make it economically viable, how do we scale it up before 5, 6, 7. So it's a combination of both of those things. And I think you're exactly right. One of the really disruptive, which means we have really great new opportunities, although we have to adapt to the change, is that additive manufacturing, by letting you go in principle from an electronic design on your computer, a computer-aided design or CAD file, directly to a finished product that needs almost nothing, or perhaps actually nothing, before you like bolt it into the larger system that it will become a key issue, uh, you know, component for, that's really interesting, that the whole supply chain, if you look at the manufacture of metal parts today, starting with a chunk of metal and gradually cutting away the parts you don't want and then producing it into the final form, finished form with maybe paint and whatnot, 90% of the time from the first touch of, okay, I'm going to make the part, I'm putting my hand on the metal and I'm going to put it in the first processing step, the first machine that will work on that piece of metal. 90% of the time between that point and when I can hand a finished part to a customer is spent with the part sitting and nothing happening to it. 90% of the time, typically. Because it's done in this machine, but we haven't gotten ready to move it to the next step. Or the next machine's busy, so we wait until we can put that part in the next machine. Changing that paradigm is a potential for additive manufacturing, and that's very interesting, and it's why we want to really put some energy into trying to figure out how to make this process of additive manufacturing practical, feasible. Thank you. Here we go. So I an impressive presentation. Most of this was over my head. Um, but, I, but it raises a, a, a broader question for me just for, that I'm curious about. Um, you know, you talked a lot about kind of the, the TRL mm -hmm. kind of bridging from, from three to eight, right? Which I guess is your four to seven kind of sure. sweet spot there. You know, you're kind of creating an app that makes these, uh, mm -hmm. you know, advanced tools much more accessible yes. for smaller, uh, presumably less sophisticated, you know. Um, no, maybe, Actually, maybe not. But I would say not. And one of the things I've learned from this with the Jekko pallet project, for example, where they're really pushing the limits of roto-molded resin plastics, is that small manufacturers don't actually have small problems. They're often just as sophisticated oh, as Lockheed Martins. Well, and the challenge is they only have one or two engineers in a 20-person company, and they can't take even one of those engineers and say, for a month, you're going to learn how to right. use that advanced stress simulation software package that solved the pallet problem for Jekko. They don't have that kind of time. They've got to keep everyday thing running. They could and, and, spend a little yeah. time, but no, no and I guess that's what I meant by less sophisticated. Not that their problems were any, any smaller, but they don't have the resources to, right. to, to, to solve them, right? And, and, and part of this is kind of bringing kind of an, an, an army of capability, right, in the form of a private, right, to get something done. Yes. I, I guess my question, though, mm -hmm. is, okay, so you do this, you work through all these grants, you have all these great partnerships with other institutions and so forth. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. who owns the intellectual property? And how do you actually commercialize this and make some money mm -hmm. off the capability that you're building? Because it, it seems like there's a, a great business opportunity in here somewhere. And, and again, this is just a, maybe a broader question about how the university monetizes its intellectual capability, but, but how do you think about moving this into kind of a commercial realm mm -hmm. as opposed to an academic investigation? And I, right. I don't mean anything pejorative in that, I'm just curious. No, 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 those are good questions, and it's part of how Purdue serves the broader society while maintaining its own sustainability. Certainly one of the ideas here would be, you know, moving over to not just manufacturinghub.org, but also manufacturinghub.com, and putting the apps up as a pay-for-use environment, where the software we used for the Jekko Pallet project, commercial software license for that, is about $40,000 for one user on one computer for one year. Jekko needed it literally for 80 runs that were done in a week. They didn't need a year's worth. They needed to run it on 100 CPUs at a time in order to get the turnaround on the job down to, you know, like 10 minutes so we could run something, look at the answers, go, okay, I see what that tells me. I need to change. I need to run this. You need an engineering process. If I was running that job on their desktop computer, if they'd spent the 40000 they would wait a day, two days, for that little computer to finish the work. And so the whole engineering optimization cycle gets really stretched out. 
And the user interface on that program is, you know, it's a wall of bricks. It's like learning Microsoft Office and all of its different ways to, you know, animate a PowerPoint and put a table into a Word document and edit a photo somewhere. I mean, there's a, so much time taken to where you can do those things. If you only need this for one week, and then the palette's figured out, and now you can maybe sell it to the customer for the next, they're looking at another five to ten years where the customer buys major amounts of these every year to gradually phase out all of their steel. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. You don't want to own the computer. You don't want to learn the software. You want to do the engineering optimization. How do we get you to where you can focus on the engineering optimization? Then they can innovate. Oh, they're good. Other questions? Hi, I'm Rat Samarji. I'm from NIST, uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased to see you involved uh, in this process. You mentioned the front offer model. Mm -hmm. That's something that's been really thorn on my side because Germans have really developed the culture, the tradition, mm -hmm. uh, to make the university industry relationship work. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've been that successful in the U.S. We seem to have more of an impedance mismatch, mm -hmm. partly because of the time scales of PhD researchers, etc. Mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, um, think you'll address that issue, or, or is that an issue for Purdue? Mm -hmm. Because you, you're not industry needs don't always fit into the PhD research of three years or whatever. Right. So the impedance mismatch and also the policy issues I think are important. So on the impedance mismatch, I've been really pleased to see how well a graduate student fits into a technical assistance program project which is limited to 40 hours. That's all that a single project will be able to get in state funding support. And so that fits into even an assistant professor who's working for tenure. Take a day or two off over a couple of months and solve a problem for a company and bring a graduate student in for some of those hours. Even if you're focused, focused on tenure, you can probably do that. And if you think it's interesting in way it relates to what your core academic focus is, then you can benefit from that exposure. So we can do that. The projects that we've done with the small manufacturers for Manufacturing Hub and the Endemic project have been a little bigger than that. But the JECO project, we had a meeting here on campus on a September 8th, nice day. And we were filming video of the results in their factory on November 21st. So it was a couple of months, a little more involved interaction. We paid for two months of the graduate students' time at half time, and we got that one done. But it was really nicely focused for that mechanical engineering graduate student. So we can find those opportunities. I think the other policy, the broader question is to get to a Fraunhofer-like engagement. We've seen a real pushback to the idea of picking winners by supporting industry but with this program, it's really more about providing an infrastructure on which any potential commercial player can come and take advantage. So it's about having a great playing field, and then the winners pick themselves by being good at what they do. And you don't have to worry about, oh, we're picking winners. We're building the workforce that's capable and has skills that you need to take it to the next level. We're providing innovation resources where you can try things out at lower cost, but anybody can come and try things out. So those who turn their back on that, fine. Those who look at it and say, hey, I can make something with this, great. So that gets past that policy conundrum, I think. And so it could hopefully get us to more like a Fraunhofer type success. Those are important. And so what we've been doing with the endemic program is that we make the software available and the high performance computing easy. And then the company right now is using without paying. I've got a company that I hope will be one of my first paying customers in a little bit later this, in a couple of months. Uh, but the IP they own. They do the work of defining how I'm using this infrastructure. I bring my own data to it. In the case of the OpenFlow uh, Manifold app, you upload your own geometry files. That's your engineering expertise. So that, that seems to make some sense. And we can try to build that out into some sort of standardized, and certainly the program requires that these centers that are being funded pay a lot of attention to that and try to come up with a common IP approach. It's a very important point. All right. Thank you very much.